On today's podcast, I'm joined by my good friend, Kristen McGee. She is one of the country's foremost yoga instructors, and she is currently one of the foremost instructors on Peloton yoga. You may have taken some of her classes. I'm really excited to bring this podcast to you because we're going to talk all about yoga. We'll talk about Pilates, the differences between the two. We'll talk about the different variations of yoga, such as Bikram yoga, hot yoga, paddleboard yoga, and all the benefits that you can get from a regular yoga practice, I guess. We're also going to talk a bit about meditation. She's also involved with Peloton meditation. I've taken some of her guided meditations and have had just great, great results from it. So let me introduce you to my guest this week, Kristen McGee. She is of Peloton fame. And once again, is one of the country's most prominent yoga and Pilates instructors. Throughout her career, Kristen has been a pioneer in making yoga more accessible. Kristen has starred in over 100 yoga and Pilates videos, including MTV workout videos and her own personal brand of yoga DVDs. She's appeared on Live with Kelly and Ryan, Good Morning America, and The Today Show. Well, as a busy mom of three boys, Kristen strongly believes that just a few minutes of yoga a day can bring both balance and harmony to your life. Kristen's classes will ground you, challenge you to focus on the moment, and connect your mind, body, and breath. If you've never done yoga, if you are a yoga aficionado, if you are on Peloton or not, I think you're really going to benefit from this episode because we've got some great actionable takeaways to help improve not only your health, but I guess your mental state and even a bit your appearance. So let's get started with my interview with Kristen McGee. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Kristen. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So, you know, I have taken your classes on Peloton for the last couple of years. We have interacted on social media, but this is our first time actually talking face to face. Well, I guess through a computer screen. Oh, no, but it's so awesome to see you. Well, let's start with your story. How did you get into yoga? And I know before you were a Peloton yoga instructor, you were one of the most sought after yoga instructors in the New York area. How did you get to that place before the Peloton? stuff. Thank you for asking. I have been teaching yoga since 1997. So I came to New York from Pocatello, Idaho, a small town in southeastern Idaho, went to NYU acting school in the 90s. And I was doing yoga classes in my acting classes as a way to warm up, to connect with our breath, to, you you know, just feel united when you're on stage. It's very similar to being in a live yoga class. It's both intimate and immediate. And I fell in love with it. It was the first time I'd ever discovered yoga. And I just thought it was incredible. So I started going every single day after acting class to Jiva Mukti, which was right on 2nd Avenue near my little apartment in the East Village. And I would study and I would practice. And when I graduated, I started teaching. And this was really before yoga was as popular as it is now. In 2003, I was teaching at a crunch in near Viacom, the MTV building. And an MTV producer asked if I would lead the first MTV yoga video. So that was cool. So I did MTV yoga. And this was back when DVDs were, you know, in vogue. So this is 2003. We did MTV yoga, power yoga, Pilates and Pilates mix. And then I just kept on riding the wave. That's when I started working with some celebrity clients and doing my own DVDs. I worked on the Home Shopping Network, selling a Pilates power gym, started writing for Health Magazine and various other outlets. And then it wasn't until 2015, I had done a campaign with Robin Arzon. And then in 2018, I reached out to her and asked her if Peloton was doing yoga. And that's how I ended up finally at Peloton. So what type of training or how is the training like to become a certified yoga instructor? And you have multiple certifications. So what does that entail? I mean, is there like you sit down, you take so many hours of coursework or classwork? Is it all hands-on? How does that work? I think it's different now and it has varied over the years. But when we first started, I had already done at least two years of just my own practice or maybe even more, like from 93 to 96. And then I was taking a yoga class at the Crunch Gym. gym, Like the Crunch Gyms were big back in the day. And one of the teachers there, Cindy Lee, said, I am leading a yoga certification who's interested. And so it was a six-month course, and we would meet weekly. And she, at the time, was married to someone who was very well-versed in Buddhist meditation. So David Nickturn led the Buddhist meditation component. She led all of the, taught us about Sanskrit, all of the asanas, 
how to adjust people in the postures, how to sequence a class. It was mostly vinyasa based, a lot of technique. We, we did a whole six month study and then we had to take an exam at the end. After that, I kept doing different courses. So I went to the yoga journal conference and studied with a bunch of different teachers in different styles just to see what it was like. That's when I was introduced to Ashtanga, to Iyengar, to Yin Yoga. And then I would go to various locations near New York. So we have the Omega Institute, the Ananda Ashram, we have Krupalu. So I kept on just taking all these different courses and retreats with instructors. And then in 2009, I did a year-long certification with Rodney Yee and Colleen Seidman through the Urban Zen. You would think this is really cool because it's all about patient advocate advocacy towards health. So it was a lot about helping people with cancer and other people who were like maybe in bed. So teaching in bed postures, we did a lot of hands-on stuff. We did a lot of restorative yoga, the breath work, meditation once again, but that was an entire long, like year long, 500 hour certification. Oh, wow. So you're doing all this stuff, you're making the DVDs, and then you do some type of project with Robin Arzan. With If you are listening and you are a Peloton devotee, her name should obviously ring a bell with you. Now, did you help start Peloton Yoga from the ground up? So very cool story. So Colleen, who I had just mentioned, who I had certified with, had a few videos on Peloton, and but they were filmed separately and they were like from a nice apartment. And I think that they had maybe talked to her about doing something more than just these few standalone yoga videos. And that's when I said, you know, why is there not an actual yoga program the same way they have cycling every day? Why is there not yoga offered every day? And at first, I think Robin said, no, we're not really hiring any yoga teachers. And a month later, she said, yes, come in. We are going to look at this. So I went in, I auditioned. And in July of 2018 is when we started kind of hashing out the entire yoga program, figuring out the styles we wanted to offer, the lengths, the different types. And then Anna came on in September, October, and Aditi came on. And then we launched in December 2018. So the three of you were the the three musketeers getting this started? The three wing, yes, exactly. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And I've taken all three of yours. I've taken a lot, all three, what you, Anna and Aditi, all of your classes. So it's, it's great. So now you're doing all of your classes on Peloton or do, are you still doing live classes outside of Peloton? We really don't do live classes outside of Peloton. I still do have a, like a, my private, one of my privates, like Steve Martin, I still see privately. So some of my private. Oh, really? Some of my private and students have been with me for 15, 20, 20 years. I still see people that have been, it's such a, a neat friendship and just clients, you know, having a, cause I think yoga is so it's neat. It's not so much working out as it is working in. So you're getting to know yourself better and then you get to know these students and you create this really cool connection and you're constantly learning and growing together and, and people change and adapt, you know, people getting older now or have different issues. So I still have a few private clients. So one of the things I feel I've noticed over the last, gosh, 15, 20 years or so is that I, it seems like millennial men are more open to yoga. You know, me being a male and I grew up in a small town in the middle of Michigan, I, I mean, yoga was not on my radar until honestly, maybe the last five to seven years. And when you look at, I think a lot more millennial men, I feel like are open to doing yoga. Like it's not this kind of woo woo, only women type of do it type of a situation. But I still feel like of all, like of my guy friends, I, there's not many of us who do yoga. And when I think about, like you mentioned Steve Martin, I think about, you know, that generation, you know, the boomer generation, I know that there are some, but it seems like there has been a seismic shift in socially okay for men to do yoga. I mean, have you seen that shift yourself over the last 20 years or so? I definitely agree with you, even with it's ironic that yoga and Pilates both were male founded. And in India, mainly men were practicing yoga. And when Joseph Pilates was the one who created Pilates, he's you know also a male. But you're right. I think there was like a drop. And now this uptick again, where you even see my mom just sent me a fun Instagram reel the other day of some professional football players practicing Pilates before the game. And you you see a lot more. I mean, you know, you heard about Michael Jordan, who was really into meditation and you see a lot more. I agree with you. Younger men, even my kids, my boys now are being exposed to mindfulness in school. So I think there's just an entire like a shift in the way people look at these mind body activities and how important it is for us to really concentrate on that as much as we concentrate on other kind of forms of exercise or, you know, because it's so I think yoga goes so much deeper in, into you could go into the philosophy 
and the background behind yoga as well. But I do think that both yoga and Pilates are just so much more than a workout. You really have like the mind body connection and you get to know yourself in a different way. So speaking of yoga and Pilates, for those people who are listening to this and maybe they haven't done Pilates before, or they're kind of new to all this, can you explain the difference between yoga and Pilates? Because some people say, oh, it's Pilates yoga. What's the difference between the two? Yeah, well, that's funny because in the 90s, when I started teaching at the gyms, I kept getting asked to sub Pilates classes. And I was like, wait, this is so different than yoga. I'm going to have to go take a certification in Pilates because they're not the same. So yoga has this you know, 5,000 year old lineage. It's has a bunch of different branches that you can not just the Hatha, not just the physical portion of the yoga practice. There's the philosophy, there's the breath work, there's the meditation with Pilates. Joseph Pilates brought the practice to the States in the 1920s. He had practiced some yoga. So you see a few similar postures in Pilates exercises, but he was working with prisoner war veterans. And he really was a genius. I think when he crafted all these different pieces of equipment that helped people access their deep core muscles. He's all about the powerhouse and how the place between your hips and your shoulders, your abdominals, your core, this is the region that you want to be working from and moving from, initiating your movement from. So all of his exercise is mainly specifically focused on strengthening the powerhouse, the core. And the core, that core work is super complementary to yoga. And the yoga flexibility, I think, is super beneficial in Pilates. So I think the two are complementary. They're just not the same. I see, I see that your kids, I think, came back. All right, the kids are coming home. They'll be quiet. <laughs> oh, it's, it's okay. If you need to say anything to them, go ahead. We can take a spot here. So what are some mistakes that people make when and practicing yoga, whether they're in your class or somebody else's, are there any things, anything that you can think of that people can use as practical advice to help make their yoga practice better or once again, avoid doing certain things that may hinder their progression with yoga? Yes, I think it's not a one size fits all practice. I think you have to look at the alignment and work within your own structure, your own physical structure. I'm sure you know, like being a doctor, everyone has a different hip socket and diff the way the femur bone hits sits in the hip socket and everyone has different shoulder mobility and men are different than women a lot of times in the way we're built. So I think it's nice first acknowledge where you are and only judge yourself against yourself because there is no competition in yoga. I love the studios that don't have any mirrors where you're just feeling your body and doing the shapes that feel right for you. To not be afraid to modify. I see people struggling to touch their toes and I'll say, bend your knees, bend your knees, bend your knees. And a lot of times people are stubborn and they don't want to. So just modify as much as you need to. I think it's great to not feel like you have to push yourself because it's a lifelong practice. There's no end goal. So you have all your life to just keep exploring these shapes and gaining flexibility. Also realizing that, you know, people think that I don't have to do yoga every day. Like, oh, you can touch your toes now. But it's, it's a similar thing as like running. If you go and run, you have to maintain the running to then still feel good on your run. Why are you running? Why are you running? It's a similar thing with yoga. Like every day I wake up, I still feel the tightness in my hips. I still feel the tightness in my shoulders. It takes me a while to warm up. Obviously, it's more second nature to me now for practicing so many years. But just like with an instrument, you know, you're going to lose your technique if you're not doing your scales every day on the piano. And then you can start to play the melodies that you like to play. It's very similar. Your body is your instrument in yoga practice. So it's your own instrument. So you get, again, you can make the tunes that you want to and not feel like you have this pressure to have to perform at any stage certain level. It's just where you're at to meet yourself where you are and to just keep going from there. Now, I know with Peloton, there are classes that are literally 10 minute yoga, 15, 20, 30 minutes. You can do it for an hour. Is there an ideal time or I guess length of time to do it that you're doing a yoga class? Like, for example, if you're saying, well, 15 minutes just usually isn't enough to get yourself relaxed and stretched out and benefit from it. Or really, is it truly whatever time you have is fine? What would you tell people, let's say, if they're starting out or maybe, you know, for me, honestly, I do a lot of 20 minute classes, but part of it is my own is that I have a hard time, I think, sticking with something. I maybe I don't have ADHD. For some reason, I think going longer than that, I get bored. Okay. That's interesting. And I have done some half hour classes. Then I do maybe a 15 one that I feel guilty. <laughs> like I'm not doing long enough. Is there an ideal length of a yoga class or a Pilates class? And, and is that different? I always think something is better than nothing. Always. I always will say like a downward, downward dog a day is better than nothing, right? So I feel like depending on your schedule, again, like it's not a one size fits all is the postures in your body. It's also not a one size fits all on how often you practice or how long you practice for. 
ideally, I think that hour long practice, if you can fit one in every now and then is so wow. nice because okay. you get a full warm up, you get a full sun salutation, you get the standing postures, you get some floor work in and then Shavasana. So many people skip Shavasana, at least the 20 minute. Are you guilty of that? <laughs> at least the 20 minute classes, we have a you know, like a 30 second to a minute Shavasana, but that's really the time when your body reaps all the benefits of the practice. And it might be the only time that you're still for the entire day. So few of us ever take that time to just be still. So I think it's really important to try and at least, you know, incorporate a little bit of longer practice once a week and get yourself a Shavasana. The 10, 15 minute classes are great though, if you're short on time and if you want to focus. So I really like the 10 minute focus flow hips and you can stack it on after a run or stack it on after a run or just do it more regularly if you tend to have really tight hips and you want to work on your hips or the focus flow back, you know, working on back here at the end of the night. I think that's really nice. So again, I don't think people should feel guilty. I think they should be feel proud of themselves for doing any yoga at all. But it is nice. You can start to get a little bit longer practice every now and then. And I know it's harder. I think it's harder at home when you're home alone and you're doing it to... I can see why 20 minutes is much easier. So ideally, you try to incorporate a, an hour class if you can each week is what you're telling me, which I hear that challenge and I will try to rise up to that. I How many that. times a week then do you recommend you know, yeah. your general clients that they yeah. try to do a yoga practice? I say two to three times a week. If you can sneak in two to three yoga practices a week, that's awesome. And again, maybe just that one class that's a little bit longer, whether it's 30, 45 or 60 minutes if you can. And maybe those two others during the week that are your 20 minutes or your 10 and your 15. It's I kind of look at it the way when I was running and training for the marathon. I don't consider myself a very active runner, but I would at least get two runs in during the week and my one long run in on the weekend because you'd have to get that long run in in order to be prepared for the marathon. And yoga practice, I feel like, is marathon training for life. It teaches you resilience. It teaches you how to connect with yourself, with your breath, to connect with others, to manage stress, to feel more mobile, to feel more relaxed. So there's so many things that you can take off the mat. So if you can get those, you know, twice a week, once on the weekend, or however you want to map it out, but maybe two shorter flows and one longer, that would be really ideal. One of the things that I've always wanted to ask a yoga instructor is what is truly for you when you're putting a yoga flow together, what is the key to a good yoga flow? So for me, I love sequencing. Like sequencing to me is key. I come from a dance background and I love choreography and I love when things flow really nicely together. It doesn't even have to be an actual vinyasa type yoga flow, but even if it's a yin practice where you're holding each posture for three minutes, if there's some sort of sequencing that makes sense so that the next posture really kind of goes well with the one right before it. And it's, it's like putting together a great meal. You know, if the appetizer is really nice and then the main course is delicious and then you've got your dessert and you feel really well rounded. I love that. Even if it's a shorter 10, 15 minute flow, if it's a little, if it's well rounded, and sequenced in the night in a right way, I think that's awesome. Like you just feel really good afterwards. Do you recommend doing a Pilates class before or after a yoga class? I typically personally like to do Pilates first because Pilates warms up the core and Pilates is a little bit more active. And again, if you're going to get a Shavasana at the end of a yoga class, it's nice to save it for the very end as opposed to doing Shavasana and then getting up and then getting really active again. I also love Pilates pre-workout, like before a run, before a ride, before a strength class and yoga post, especially more static holds. If you're doing like a hip opening flow or you're doing something, if you do a really dynamic yoga flow, a power yoga, you could do that before an active activity, but generally I like to do the Pilates first, then the yoga. So in Peloton yoga, there are basically three levels of yoga classes. There's beginner, there's intermediate, and there's expert. I started off a beginner when I started doing it. I'm now, I feel, and I'm very proud of this, I'm an intermediate level, although there are a few things I can't do intermediate very well. How do you know if you're doing these classes where, when you should go up from beginner to intermediate or intermediate to expert? Well, that's what's so nice about the yoga practice is it's a listening practice, listening to your body, listening to when it might be time. Like you'll start to feel a little antsy or curious. You're like, okay, now I feel pretty comfortable doing all these beginner classes. I want to dip my toe in the deep end and see what's next. And then if you take an intermediate class and it feels like it's too much, you can always modify with props or you can go back 
back to beginner classes until you feel more comfortable. I think it's nice to have had, you know, at least 30 classes under your belt before you move on to the next level, more or less. I think it's nice to have a good foundation. But that being said, too, there might be people who come from a dance background or who come from a place where they're like very familiar with their body and it feels natural and easy to progress faster. So it's listening to your body. And then it's also not being afraid to step out of your comfort zone. So at some point, you have to kind of nudge yourself a little bit to say, okay, I'm going to take the intermediate class like you did. You admitted there might be a few postures that are still a little challenging for me, even in advanced classes. There's always postures for me that are too challenging, but it's just a matter of how much do I want to push myself? How much do I want to gain a little more confidence in a handstand, which has always been very tough for me. So I think it's listening to your body and then just nudging yourself to experiment with it and then playing around with it. You know, if it feels like it was too much, you can always modify. That's the beautiful thing about yoga. I started doing yoga when I think I came to a realization as I saw my father and my father-in-law, both of them are in their 80s. You know, their idea of exercise is just walking. You know, that's all they do really for exercise is walking. My dad golfs too. And he's got this idea that golf is like this great, great exercise, which is fine. Like he's in his 80s. And I started seeing some of my friends and people as they get into their 50s. And I realized how their balance and coordination so diminished as they get older. And so it got me into thinking like, okay, when I think about how do I want to live my life when I'm in my 70s and my 80s, I want to be that guy who is going hiking and rock climbing and not feeling like I am limited due to mobility issues. And so I started thinking like, how do I keep my balance, my mobility, my flexibility as I've gotten older? My wife has told me for years, Tony, you, you know, you should do yoga, you should do yoga. And like most Gen X guys that grew up in a small town in the middle of Michigan, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I know it's something I should do. I'll do it someday. And finally, I think that day came several years ago and I thought, you know, I really got to do this. And then I saw the statistic as I was doing some research for my book that a very, very high percentage of men and women over the age of 50, if they break their hip, they die. Like it's a very high mortality rate. And so I started thinking like, yeah, I don't want to be, and, and I like, I'm I, at the time I was not at 50 yet, but I saw that coming around the bend and I thought, I don't want to be that guy. So for me, starting the practice of yoga has been a path for me to hopefully continue being active and mobile and agile and have good balance and not get injured. So I will not have to limit my activities as I get older. Now you've been doing yoga for a long time. How has yoga changed for you as you have gotten older? Maybe in what you're doing and how you look at yoga as you get older. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I think back in the day, I always had to be like, not always, but I feel like I thought it was more vigorous. Like I like to go and take two hour long classes and teacher workshops that were, you know, really intense. And I pushed myself a lot more back in the day. I felt like I was, you know, if the teacher would say like, bind, do a bind, I would definitely be bound. And I would definitely be like moving up to the most advanced variation of whatever posture they were saying, or at least trying. And I think as I get older and older, I notice that the simpler, the better that sometimes just examining mountain pose and feeling really strong standing in a nice alignment is the hardest yoga. And I don't need all these fancy tricks. You know, I, I like nowadays, I just modify if it feels nicer to rest my elbow on my thigh in extended angle, I do so and I don't bind and there might be days where I do bind. I think I've become a lot better at listening to my body and just doing what feels right for me. Also exploring yin yoga more where there's these longer held postures that feel really nice and challenging myself in different ways. So like the postures like the handstands, the arm balances, doing a press up handstand, which would have been very daunting to me when I was younger. Now I'm exploring it in a different way where I'm exploring some more challenging postures, but just in a different way that's not like I'm pushing myself in a two hour sweaty vinyasa class. Instead, I'm building strength and working on my agility and my bone density. And because doing handstand, I find you have to also strength train it to us to a degree. And as a female getting older, I think strength training is super important. So finding that kind of strength in my practice, but also realizing that my practice doesn't have to be super hard every time I can just enjoy it. So I've got a number of different kind of newer ways that people are doing yoga. And I'd like to go over them with you, your kind of brief thoughts on each and see what you think about because people are doing 
all different. It's not just yoga class anymore. It's all different types of yoga classes. Uh, That was one I was going to ask you about, but we'll get to that in a sec. So just to get a little background, this for spring break, we went to uh, Park City to go skiing with my family and my son. He's a senior. And they have uh, outside of Park City, this, it literally looks like a huge anthill. And inside of it's a crater. And at the bottom of the crater is basically, it's like a pond that's filled with volcanically heated water. And we took a paddleboard yoga class in it, which I've never done paddleboard yoga before. I've had a recent shoulder injury, so I've been dealing with that. So I didn't do the best with it. I tell you, I probably fell off that paddleboard like 15 times. My daughter went through and did it. Fell zero. She's a dancer. She didn't fall once. Have you done paddleboard yoga? And what are your thoughts on that? Paddle yoga for sure. And I love it. It is so much fun. Did you have the paddle anchored though? Did you put an anchor down so it wasn't? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So they had the front and the back kind of tied off. Yes. Uh, But you know, what surprised me was there are poses that are, you know, in general, like not difficult, like warrior and on a paddleboard, it's a whole other story. <laughs> like I oh, can't yeah. even do a warrior pose. I kept falling. Yep, completely. It really tests your balance in a different way. It's like being on that unstable surface. It's fun because it definitely makes you more aware of like all the little muscles you have to engage. Speaking of Pilates, like getting into your core. A really funny story. One of my dear friends, who's an amazing yoga teacher, she and I like came up together teaching yoga. We went on a yoga journal cruise. I think this is in 2005. And it's similar to what you were saying with the stand-up paddle because we would do yoga on the boat in the morning and you're on this big mass a boat, but there's still the feeling of unevenness yeah. when you're on the water. And so it was this constant, like having to shift and find your midline. It was so fun. And I remember Shiva Ray was on that and she did a, like a rave yoga in the basement of the boat one night oh, with wow. the strobe lights and everything. It was fun. What do you think about hot yoga? Is Bikram yoga and hot yoga the same thing? Yes and no. So Bikram yoga is a set series of postures, kind of like Ashtanga. Ashtanga is a set flow. Bikram, you do the same 26 postures every time that Bikram Shodari created. But hot yoga can just be like hot flow or hot any sequence you want. So if you want to just heat the room to 110 degrees and do a vinyasa practice, that could be hot yoga. But Bikram, you're always going to be doing the same 26 postures. So I am personally not a fan of hot yoga. I think that there is this feeling of being more open than you actually are. So you're in the heat, you get really sweaty, people can tend to overstretch. Secondly, the goal of the breath work in the practice, partially why we breathe in and out through our nose the whole time is to heat the body internally. And I think it's better to build your own heat and to listen to your body again on that level. I know some people think that it's awesome and you feel really sweaty, but I also find it a little dangerous. Like you're slipping on your yoga mat or your I also find it a little unsanitary not to, you know, just to say like, it just feels like there's a lot of like sweat in the room. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. I'd go to a background class and it would be carpeted floor. And I would just feel like every drop of sweat was just in that carpet. I don't know, but that's yeah. a personal thing. I, I know people love hot yoga. For me, I'd rather be in a normal temperature room and build my own heat. I don't want the room to be cold, but. I know a relative, I've not done hot yoga before. My issue is exactly like you. I've heard that some people are doing it in carpeted rooms and it just grosses me out that I'm standing on because, you know, yoga is a barefoot practice and now you're standing on somebody's old sweat and ugh. Ugh. Brother, Uh, But I do have a relative of mine who is older who had actually a uh, pacemaker and did a hot yoga class and passed out. (laughs) Hit his nose and broke his nose. (laughs) And yeah, they had to bring him out and it's like, yeah, I mean, and part of me at the time was like, come on, like, you know, they should know better. Putting a guy who's obviously older, who does have some chronic health issues in a room like that and having him do that, it just isn't, it's not necessarily safe. I feel like it for the right person, maybe it's great if you're in great shape and you can deal with the dehydration and all of that. But I agree with you. I think it's a practice that is probably more of an advanced practice where you really have to know your body well and, you know, know when you should stop. And for somebody who's more of a casual person, especially if you've got chronic health issues, then that may not be the place to start with. Agree. I completely agree. Just a couple others. I'd love to hear your thoughts on acro yoga. This sounds fun. I don't know what it is, but it sounds fun. It's really fun. I've done a few acro classes and it's fun being the base because you don't realize you're as strong. Like a small person can actually hold a larger person if you're in the right alignment. If you're the base and say you're flying someone in different postures. It's fun being the person up hey, top boy. being, you know, flown because you feel like this sense of kind of freedom. It's a little 
So they for like never you never put your kids on your feet and do like the airplane when they were little. Did you ever do that yeah. where you're yeah. on your back and your kids are on their tummy and they're oh yeah. I mean, that's what acro reminds me of. Where like two oh. people are, one's a base and one is doing yoga postures, say on someone's feet, for instance. Like you might go into a bow pose, balancing okay. your tummy on someone's feet who's supporting you. Oh wow! Um, it's very circus like. Yes. Like I feel like it's very like you know, or like someone might stretch you a little deeper if they put your foot a foot in your back and pull your elbows and your arms back in a certain way. Is that going to be then more of an advanced? For sure. And speaking of advanced, not necessarily puppy yoga and goat yoga. Have you ever taught a class like that or taken one of those types of classes? Neither one. I've never taught or taken, but I was invited to do a puppy <laughs> yoga class to take one. And I guess it's really sweet because you just have all these little puppies running around you. And then the goat yoga, I have no idea what that entails. I'm assuming that you're doing yoga with goats. What? But I think that kind of like the yoga in the heated room, I think yoga in and of itself is enough. I really don't think you need all of the extra bells and whistles. Like if I want to go see some cute puppies, I'll go see some cute puppies. But I don't know if I need them running around me when I'm practicing yoga. You know, my cat always comes up to me when I'm practicing and that's cute. and That's fine. Sometimes I think people just are looking for some ways to mix it up or make things a little more, you know. Entertainment. I, I was watching The Amazing Race the other day and they were in Germany and they did a beer yoga class where oh my gosh. they would do certain poses and then they would drink, drink beer it. and uh, it's kind of defeating i guess it's not really defeating the purpose but hey anything that gets you active it's that's that's, that's all good and i had a friend who used to lead yoga and wine re, um, retreats and it was nice because his thoughts were after you finish your yoga practice your senses are more heightened because you've really dropped in you've really been listening feeling you know your taste buds are more heightened so he would do like a chocolate and wine pairing after a yoga class because you're very open at that moment and that was really fun it was a more social event you know you take a yoga practice and then you feel really good afterwards and then you can smell the wine you can savor the wine you can slow down and you can really experience something in a new way. Do you have five more minutes where you can talk about meditation and breath work? Yeah, I think we're talking. I just feel bad as long as my kids are fine. I'm totally fine. Oh, you're good? Okay. All right, cool. We'll uh, transition into meditation. We'll go maybe five minutes and then we'll finish up if that's, that's cool fine. with you. Thank okay. you for being so uh, go with the flow. And it's all good. My kids are older now, but I remember back those days. <laughs> so. so you also conduct medic medit classes. And there obviously is some overlap with yoga and meditation. I honestly, I'd love to do both. I do a lot more yoga than meditation. I feel like I should do more. I myself have felt some of the very powerful effects of meditation. Would love to hear from you, like how you got into meditation and then how I guess you prefer to meditate on your own. I know you give classes on it, you know, or you have the, the guided meditations. That's probably the better way to describe it. But how do you practice meditation and how do you find that it benefits you and or your clients? Meditation, I think, has been one of the most life altering practices for myself, especially more recently because I added in a second meditation for the day. So I used to always wake up and practice meditation in the morning and consistent, but not always consistent. Once my first son was born, I think I kind of fell off of it for a while and then it would come and go. I did a Vedic meditation training with a man named Light Watkins over two and a half years ago, I'd say maybe. And it, he's really a firm believer of doing 20 minutes twice a day. So 20 minutes in the morning and another 20 minutes sometime in the afternoon as like a refresh. It's like washing the clothes again or wringing out the dirty dish rag. Like you've already gone through all of these hits through the day. So you have this extra opportunity then to reframe everything, reconnect and go into the second half of your day. And that's been really amazing for me. I've noticed ever since adding that second meditation, I've been so less reactive, better responding with my children, feeling much calmer, just more aware of things. I just feel like a different person, much lighter, happier, more even, like more balanced, less huge highs and lows. That's a mantra based meditation where you are assigned a mantra and it's your own mantra and the mantra just helps you drop in. So the second I sit down, my mantra comes up, but then eventually it fades to the background and I just find myself sitting for 20 minutes. And it's become pretty second nature now at this point. When I first started years ago, when I did the teacher training with Cindy Lee, her husband taught us some Buddhist meditation. And I don't just don't know if it just didn't resonate with me as much. And then I would come and go through different guided meditations. But I find that the guided meditation is wonderful for people to start with. 
it's a great entry way. It's a wonderful way for people to, it's like having the training wheels on the bike and you get really comfortable with that. And then eventually it's nice to take the training wheels off and see if you can eventually just start to sit without needing any prompts or any sort of, you know, if you could just start and listen to your breath, or maybe you pull up a mantra that you resonates with you and then it gets you into that state. What I was going to say, the biggest misconception about meditation, people think that their minds just have to be completely blank during meditation. Like not supposed to be, you know, thoughts are not supposed to come up or, oh, I'm not good at meditating because I think the entire time. There are so many days where I'm meditating where that's all I do is think about what my day is going to be like. I'm planning every hour. I'm thinking about my voice. I'm thinking about a schedule. I'm thinking about what happened. You know, that's totally fine. Like those are, that's just as good as the days where you are meditating and you drop in a little bit and you create some space between the thoughts. It's very similar to even when I was doing the marathon training. Some days I would run and I would feel really good. And other days I would run and I would feel really crappy. And I would think that was the worst run. I felt horrible. I hated it. Those runs that sometimes are the ones that are more beneficial than the runs you felt great on. They're the ones that are training you for when you are in that marathon and you're not feeling so great. And you're like, I'm going to power through this. So I think it's fine to get lit, to get lost in thought. I think it's great to just make that dedication of showing up at a, a similar time every day and sitting with yourself and listening to your breath, starting with guided meditations. And then eventually, if you wanted to add a second one during the day, great. It's just a nice way to reconnect and kind of refresh everything. Yeah. I think where I find meditation to be most helpful for me is with anxiety. And I'm not normally, I'm not technically an anxious person, but there are times I think in life where there's no, let's say, specific reason why you should feel anxious. But sometimes I, some days I wake up and I just have a little more of kind of that worry. It's almost like a cloud hanging over of just worry, uh, you know, and it's not like I'm specifically worried about one thing or another, but there's just this kind of overlying anxiety. And so what I'll do is I'll take 10 minutes where I will just meditate. And by meditating, you know, a lot of people think, oh, what are you doing? You know, you mentioned, oh, you have a mantra. For me, it's just uh, being in a quiet room and just trying to pay attention to my breathing. And I find it can be very, very calming. And then as I did some study into it, as I was researching for my book, I started finding that there's so much evidence that there are neural connections that can change due to meditation. There is uh, so much that you can do to improve the, your overall health just by the simple act of meditation, which doesn't seem like if you're in Western medicine, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. You know about physiology and things like that, but the thought of, okay, taking 20 minutes in a day where you just sit down and either you do a guided meditation where you're being quiet and you're listening to somebody tell you, you know, breathe in, breathe out, pay attention, you know, feel your hands and your toes. Or for me, when I don't have time for that and I'm sitting in my car, let's say outside the hospital in the parking lot, just paying attention to my breathing as I set my stopwatch for 10 minutes and I emerge from that feeling much better. There are so many benefits to meditation that I think just the average person doesn't realize. And especially, you know, a lot of my followers are people in the quote unquote flyover states, you know, they don't have, you know, meditation for them. It's like, what, you know, is that something that's like, you know, not Christian? Is it pagan? Is it something that's, you know, woo woo? And it's like, really, all you have to do is quiet down and just like, listen to your thoughts for 20 minutes and then try it. Just do it a few times and see how you feel afterwards. And I strongly encourage you if you're listening to this podcast or you're watching it, just doing something very simple like that. Whether you have Peloton or not, you don't have to do a guided meditation. Just taking that time to be quiet, to listen to your body, to feel your body, and to allow yourself just that time to focus on yourself can make massive changes in how you feel and in just simple things like your anxiety level. So true. And I do think that's where sometimes that Shavasana at the end of a yoga practice is a nice introduction to people. Like, oh, I'm laying still now for five minutes, doing absolutely nothing. I dropped in and then it's like, okay, I'm going to get more and more comfortable with just being still, being quiet. And then, and you know, and the other thing too, is it doesn't have to be some formal seat. You don't have to sit in. And I, I loved how you said you're in your car. You don't have to sit in comfortable cross-legged seat. You can sit however you want to. You can give yourself some back support if you need. I'll do it in the subway. Sometimes I'll do it when I'm waiting for my boys at their gym class. If they're in the back doing their parkour, I'll find it doesn't matter if it's noisy around you. It doesn't have to be any sort of formal thing. It's just you connecting with yourself every day no matter what. 
and getting really close to yourself. It's like a wonderful, beautiful practice for people. And just a quick tip, if you're goal oriented like me and the thought of just staying there for 20 minutes and not doing anything, it's like, what can I do that? Here's a quick little tip. For me, one of the things I do is I have a laser helmet that I put on my head with lasers to try to, because my hair, I noticed my hair was thinning. And so you can wear that. And that's about a 25 minute treatment. And then you can also put on a red light mask for your face. And that's usually about a good 10 to 15 minute treatment. So there you go. You can literally multitask where you meditate and you also infuse your scalp and your face with red light therapy. So now you're also turning back the clock physically. That's one of the things that I'm trying to do. I'm not great with it, but I'm like, hey, why don't I just meditate while I have? Because when you've got a red light mask on, you can't really do a whole lot anyway. So might as well meditate and kill two birds with one stone. There you go. So true. I love that. Yeah. For those people who are very like, I need to still accomplish something. But what the interesting <laughs> thing too is what you'll notice is how much more you can accomplish once you start meditating. There's that saying, you know, where the, I think it's, I don't know, the, the Buddha who's like, I have to, or the monk who's like, oh, I have so much on my plate today. I don't have time to meditate for an hour. And his teacher says, okay, then meditate for two. You know, it's like, <laughs> So then you need to meditate for two hours because actually the more you meditate, the easier it is to stay focused and get more done. You know, you wouldn't think of it that way, but just by taking out that, taking that time out to do it actually gives you more time and notice the effects more so when you start to miss your meditation practice. Like you were saying, I don't know if you noticed, like if you've gone a few days where you don't get that meditation in, is your anxiety a little worse? Do you notice your, you know, I notice on the days where I miss my second meditation, I'm like, oh, no wonder why I was so agitated at the end of the day now, or it's just interesting. Well, love to finish this interview by you stating the saying that you give at the end of all of your lessons, which I could almost say it, but I'm probably going to get it wrong. So I'll have you state it. And if you can tell me what that means to you, because I think my audience can take a lot from it. I started using this phrase way back when I was teaching and I don't even know where it came from. But at the end of class one day, after I told everyone to seal in their practice, I said, just remind yourself that everything you could possibly ever want, have or need is right here inside of you. And maybe it was something I needed to hear. And ever since then, I would close out my classes saying that phrase just to remind people like, just remember that everything is inside of you. You just have to stay confident, listen to yourself, listen to your gut, know that you have the answers to most everything thing you need in life. And not to say that we're not going to gather a bunch of amazing, useful information from the outside world and from people around us. But at the end of the day, it's about coming back and then listening to what you really want and what you really need. And so I love to say that to remind that to not only everyone else, but myself as well, because I think we all go through those moments of doubt or wonder or hesitating. And on, we kind of doubt our hearts sometimes and get into our heads. And it's really nice to just allow yourself to sink in and remind yourself like, okay, If I just listen carefully, I will find the answers from within. Well, her name is Kristen McGee. She is a Peloton yoga instructor. She's one of the country's foremost yoga instructors here in the United States. She's located in New York City. She just finished the London Marathon. So congratulations on that. Her website is kristenmcgee.com. We'll have a link in our caption below. She's also very active on Instagram and on TikTok. So I would encourage you to check her out there. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to your next book as well. We'll have you come back when it's time to promote that definitely and i'll I'll find a quiet space when my kids are in school (laughs) (laughs) it's all good thank you for being so accommodating i really appreciate it thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join me today my name is dr anthony yoon and this is the dr yoon show thank you so much everybody for watching for listening if you've been enjoying this podcast if you can leave a rating or review on itunes it definitely helps me spread the word and we will see you next week thank you so much remember as always to eat real food use clean skincare and auto juvenate before you operate